Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. the fourth trimester podcast. This is Sarah Trott and I'm here with my co-host Esther Gallagher and I'm also here with our special guest Shanti Smith who I'll introduce shortly. I wanted to remind everyone that they can go to our website which is fourthtrimesterpodcast.com and sign up for our newsletter so you can hear more from us and you can also sign up to be a sponsor. There's a link on our website and you can also go directly to patreon.com and search for our podcast and sponsor us there. So Shanti Smith has joined us. We're so grateful to have her here. Um, she does many things. And first and foremost, she's a midwife. In particular, I wanted to highlight that she is an advanced prenatal birth and attachment therapy practitioner. She is also a somatic experiencing practitioner. And then the holistic pelvic care practitioner work that she does is also fantastic. Uh, Shanti supports families and individuals here in the Bay Area, but also if you don't live in the Bay Area, that's totally fine. You can talk with her over the web and uh, listen to her sessions by going on her website, which is embodiedbeginnings.com, embodiedbeginnings.com, and we'll post a link to that as well. Anyone listening to the podcast today can receive 50% off an initial Skype session with Shanti. If you mentioned the podcast, so that's amazing. Thank you. Super cool. Yeah. Welcome, Shanti. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. Tell us more about what you do because that was a quick bio, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do what is needed and I specialize in working with families mm-hmm. and that is um, from training in the healing arts for the last 20 years. I was a massage therapist and cranial sacral practitioner and yoga teacher before I began uh, my training as a midwife about 14 years ago. And um, in midwifery school, I um, wanted to really understand all of the elements of birth. And, um, and also I wanted to be able to help families in preventing and healing trauma if that occurred. And so I trained with Ray Castellino and um, Myrna Martin. I assisted her and did this program in pre and prenatal birth therapy that really changed how I look at birth and uh, supports me to help families um, who are working with with those early patterns that are um, have been challenging. And uh, and then because I was so interested in how um, trauma happens, developmental trauma, I did a training in somatic experiencing, uh, which is specifically on how trauma is held in the body and how we can use our awareness to support healing um, through somatic awareness. So those are a few of the things that I do. Recently, in the last couple of years, I was trained also in holistic pelvic care, which is um, working, doing internal um, pelvic floor support for women postpartum and also for fertility and for different times in life. Um, my, this really satisfies, satisfies my clinical part of me, the, the midwife part of me and the, the massage therapist part of me and the trauma healing part of me to be able to actually work with the body, um, work with a woman postpartum, um, for physical and emotional and spiritual healing that might need to happen after having a baby. So those are a few of the things that I do. (laughs) I was looking at your website and I saw some cool pictures of women standing in a circle and doing different poses. Mm-hmm. And I saw another picture of people putting their hands in a circle and it just looks like fun. Mm-hmm. I don't know what part of that this is, but. Mm-hmm. Well, I also amazing. teach birth professionals 
because I, um, I've lived in different places in the world and, um, and as a midwife, as, as some midwife who specializes in all of these different things, I found that doulas and midwifery students and birth professionals, um, wanted to learn how to incorporate some of these practices into their own, um, in their own practice. And so I do a lot of work with groups with, with doulas and different birth professionals to teach them how to help people heal, help their clients heal. Could we, um, maybe get a little more specific and have you maybe draw a more, um, intimate picture of how you might work with women encompassing all your skills. I don't want to separate out any sure. in particular because from my vantage point, I imagine that you bring all of those elements to bear. Mm -hmm. And because this is about the fourth trimester, typically on our podcast, we're usually addressing the fourth trimester. Maybe you can talk a little bit more specifically about how, if I, if I came to you, mm -hmm. say, uh, sometime in the fourth trimester, presumably, and said, gee, you know, my pubic symphysis is giving me a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, and, or I find that holding my baby to breastfeed is mm -hmm. therefore difficult, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm, I'm being very specific and tying things together in a particular way, but, you know, maybe you can, uh, as I say, draw us a little picture of what it means to work with somebody in the fourth trimester mm -hmm. to do pelvic floor, um, mm -hmm. uh, therapy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Great. So the the holistic pelvic care I'm trained in is through Tammy Kent, who wrote the book The Wild Feminine, and and so I just want to let people know that. And then I bring in other work as well. the The way that I would work with with this client would be to um, to really um, sit down together and talk about how this happened <laughs> what what led to the the pubic symphysis pain and um and what's happening with breastfeeding and we might sit together um and and look at posture and look at how she's holding the baby and I work with uh with everyone um based on intention so what is she wanting mm -hmm. right so what is her goal in our session and from there we can we can attend to um, resolving the challenge. And so it might be that we move, that we do a lot of talking in the beginning, or it might mean that we move, you know, straight into the, the physical uh, support. And Let me um, interject there. So I could imagine this situation where I come to you and say, I'm having symphysis, pubic pain, and mm -hmm. breastfeeding is complicated by that. And that's very specific and mm -hmm. And then the intention being, I would like that to improve. I'd like to not be having that pain, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what if I just came to you in a kind of collapsed state, just saying, mm -hmm. I just don't know what to do with myself. I, I'm, I'm experiencing pain. I'm not having what I thought I would have in terms of the joy of the postpartum period. And I'm, I just feel lousy and I don't know what to do. Well, I am imagining there's a lot of oh, talking, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. So. I, at first, I would normalize that. Yeah. I would talk about how, how common that is mm -hmm. and how challenging the fourth trimester can be. And, um, and then we would spend some time discovering the intention, discovering what she would like to feel, uh, what she's missing from, from her life. And, and then from there, we look at what's keeping anyone, what's keeping her from having her intention. Right. So what's blocking that feeling that she's wanting? And so if it's physical or emotional and often they're connected, then we work through the history. Often we work through how um, it could be that we we go back to her own birthing experience when she was being birthed as a baby and what was happening for her. Um, if maybe she was never breastfed. Right. And so let's look at that. And how is it for her then to be a breastfeeding mother? Um, we might look at uh, her pregnancy and her birth plan. And, and did she receive what she wanted from her birth? Or is there some integration that needs to happen? So there's a lot of ways that we can go. And sometimes my hands will be in contact. It, but sometimes, especially if I'm working via Skype, then it's an energetic connection. 
with the client and, um, and I might be coaching the client to take care of themselves in a, in a comfortable way and maybe lying down during our session. But if I'm with the person in, in the session, then my hands might be, um, on them and in a craniosacral touch, which is a very light touch, really helping nourish the nervous system and the fluid system so that, um, it can help the mother and the birthing parent really drop into, uh, their innate health that orient back to their, their blueprint of health. Mm-hmm. Because especially with birth and after birth, there's so many things that are happening and such a huge learning curve that, and there's often quite a bit of exhaustion that just a little hands on support mm-hmm. or if it's Skype, then energetic support where we can slow things down, then the client can drop, so to speak, can, can find that relaxation, that whole, and be held in that. And then the health comes forward, mm-hmm. right? And um, so I actually don't, even though I have a lot of tools, I'm trying to do as little as possible, right? Because I trust in the inherent health of, of my client. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like I know my experience of both craniosacral and somatic experiencing work mm-hmm. is like there's an invitation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a very loving, nourishing Mm -hmm. invitation that sort of draws in the direction of where you're headed. Yeah, Yeah, it's creating a safe space. Mm -hmm. And often in the fourth trimester, there's so much happening, right? All the time, right? There's breastfeeding and there's changing, you know, so many things that are needing to be done all the time and trying to sleep and trying to eat. And so taking this time and space allows for healing just by taking that space. And then by having it be safe, by really bringing in the healing tools, then the transformation can happen to help whatever was holding be integrated. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and there's a renewal so that the client can go, oh, okay, <laughs> I can, I can go back to this challenging thing and with a little bit more feeling of support mm-hmm. or maybe it won't be challenging anymore. Mm-hmm. When I work with clients with their babies, um, if there's trouble with breastfeeding or if there's some frustration or the, you know, the baby's having a hard time or there's some repair that needs to be made around bonding and attachment, Well, I'll often work with babies in what we call the the breast crawl, right? Or the supported attachment and have the baby on the belly and crawling up and telling its story. And I have seen, I, 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 I can, (laughs) my tears (laughs) are there sometimes in sessions because it can be so healing to watch uh, a baby and a, a mom, a birthing parent reconnect in this way. And, um, it can happen in just one session. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's back up because we've talked, we've touched on in this podcast several times on somatic experiencing. Mm. And um, I know I've taken the time to um, give my sort of what I think of as my orientation towards what's going on with it. And I tend to describe it in terms of the nervous system having had an experience that um, uh, put the body in a, you know, fight, flee, freeze Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. situation. And uh, so often, I think for women, it's freeze Mm -hmm. Uh, so often. Um, uh, while we may be experiencing the desire for all three, <laughs> we we find ourselves doing one of those three things with no outlet, with no circuit mm-hmm. kind of being experienced to kind of go through the whole process of what the central nervous system typically would need to do as an animal to kind of move then mm-hmm. into a sense of freedom and resource. Um that's my description. Yeah, beautifully said. Oh, gosh, thanks. <laughs> um, 
but maybe you'd like to pick up on that and, and maybe give our listeners a little, uh, maybe particularize it to uh, the work that you do so that, you know, a mama who's feeling frozen or like she just has to get out of here, but she can't or, or um, she just, her claws are out all the time, uh, you know, whatever she's experiencing with that kind of frustration, right? Mm-hmm. Like up against something mm-hmm. and not moving mm-hmm. can, um, mm-hmm. how she can benefit like how she you would work with her yeah definitely uh, so there's a lot of different definitions of trauma and one of the easiest definitions that I like to use is um, too much too fast like compression uh, overwhelm and often trauma happens um, when there's right too much going on and it's too fast and there's not a sense of completion and so a lot of healing work we work that's based in trauma healing is is looking at the story and slowly healing the story the the and looking at the places where um, there was interruption in the sequence and so in birth this is often um, the case not always right we 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 love when births are are um, coherent and <laughs> everyone can process and, and be present through them. And often at the end of birth, right, as those who have experienced it who are listening and for birth workers who are listening, it can get very fast, right, in the transition or in the pushing or in the actual birthing phase. And there can be a time of fear sometimes. Um, and so that can also increase the pressure um, of of the birth process and so sometimes that freeze has been held since the birth because the completion the follow-through and integration didn't necessarily get to happen so if we look at the the five phases of a sequence which is based on the the pre and prenatal birth therapy work i do we uh we have an intention right which is conception <laughs> right this little being wants to come in and then we have the preparation the action with the preparation is the prenatal phase moving into the birthing which is the action phase and then the follow through is the fourth phase and that's the immediate postpartum right that's when the baby comes out and finds its way ideally to the breast and then the integration is those is the fourth trimester right is when you make sense of everything that happened so and that, you know, we could expand on that, but that's a basis, basic um, tough explanation for the five phases. And so I'm always looking at that when I'm working with a client or a family, like where in the five phases did, did something get interrupted? Mm-hmm. And let's attend to that. And maybe also working with the parents in their own birth history again, like where in their own birth history did something get interrupted? And so I also am working with, birth professionals in that way, right? So when I teach to birth professionals or when I'm working with midwives doing supervision or doula supervision around how the birth was for them, then we're looking at the sequencing. And um, so if a client is um, experiencing a state of freeze, right, coming back to uh, your original question, then we look at when did that freeze begin? Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and what's keeping them from from uh, finding that ease again in, in their body. And there's something else that I work with, which is the, the polyvagal system, the social engagement system, which is um, instead of just the flight freeze, flight and uh, fight freeze um, collapse, right? Sympathetic, parasympathetic. We are all, we found that there's this social engagement system, which is, why well, I love doulas and midwives because doulas and midwives, specifically postpartum doulas, support social engagement system to come on board. So what the social engagement system is, is tend and befriend. It's actually what happens before we move to flight, fright, freeze um, if we have support. And so social engagement system is our, it has to do with our uh, vagus nerve and has to do with eye contact, has to do with um, smiling and connection. So this is why bonding and attachment is so important. And 
in the beginning and eye contact with the baby and the parents with each other, if there's two parents or whoever is helping raise the family, raise the baby, and, uh, and also at the birth. I'm very um, <laughs> passionate about having the birth team making eye contact and being, staying connected because the birthing uh, parent feels that, right? So when uh, I'm working with families postpartum, there's a lot of social engagement, right? There's a lot of right coming out of the freeze through checking in about uh, how the eye contact is and, and can they connect in with their baby and can they feel their baby since, you know, skin on their skin and, you know, be, like feeling the sensation of connection. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I like to go first. <laughs> and, and that can be, um, that can be part of the repair for, for disruption and bonding and attachment. And, uh, and also for integrating the trauma and even in, in somatic experiencing work and in the, the birth trauma healing work, when we're looking back at what might have happened, we can look and see when was there a time where, you know, where something good was happening. So in that time where, say, for example, a family has to transfer to the hospital from a planned home birth, right? So can you remember the midwife sitting with you in the car? What was, how was that? Right. Or was there a time where you felt connected? Right. Oh, my doula was holding my hand and she looked at me and she said, you will be OK. And I knew I would be OK. Right. It's those moments that we need to bring to the forefront. And then um, from there, there's there's more resource to work with the places that were more scary. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking about my own birth and how. um I've told this story before, <laughs> how during my transition, from transition into pushing, I, you know, I didn't know what was going on around me in a very tiny space about the size of the room we're in now, uh, really much. It was all very internal. And then I suddenly had this question go through my mind, Timmy, where's Timmy? And I opened my eyes and there she was like, mm -hmm. and then later like after Susie was born, I was losing a modicum of blood. And so um, midwives were concerned. And Timmy was a, an apprentice midwife at the time. Suddenly, she was right next to me. Mm. She had a big glass of something. Red raspberry leaf tea, as, <laughs> as I remember it. But I don't actually know. And she looked at me and she said, Esther, drink this, drink this and stop bleeding right now. Mm-hmm. And like that is such a central feature of my birth story. Mm -hmm. You know, here I'm just like loving up this new baby who's all over my body and I'm losing blood and I don't, don't even know it, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. she she interrupted, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense mm -hmm. to like save my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was a very integrating, yes. integrated moment of my story, as you're yes. pointing out. And um and all in the mix, mm -hmm. and very much all those features that you mm -hmm. suggest, the eye contact, the social, emotional, the mm -hmm. physical mm -hmm. body, all of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very powerful. Great. Thanks and that's 39 that. years ago, people. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. <laughs> I have not forgotten those moments. <laughs> no, you don't forget. You yeah. don't forget the healing and the yeah, the connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nor how I was feeling. Like mm -hmm. internally, like I was completely okay, relaxed and integrated and I could get this information. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also was overwhelmed, right? Mm -hmm. As you say, like I had a new baby in my arms. It was like mm -hmm. a very, very powerful moment. But all of this is well integrated, mm -hmm. right? Even right. the stuff that could be scary. Right. Yeah. It right. just all fit together, all right. worked out. Right. And so what we're really talking about is is layers of support, mm -hmm. right? Which is so important in the postpartum time. And if you can begin in the preconception time, then that prepares you for the postpartum, right? If you can do that through pregnancy and you can have your birth team who you trust, they're, who's going to, you know, they're going to come sit next to you when you need them. Mm -hmm. Right then, in that postpartum time, you know what support is like, and you know that it's it's invaluable. Right, that you know that you need to have it set up to receive support. 
you're being witnessed, you're being mm-hmm. nourished, mm-hmm. you're being, yeah. in, you know, your, your integration is being supported. And we've heard that over and over mm-hmm. from other guests too. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. That uh, the best time to mm-hmm. find out mm-hmm. what resources are available and to create your plan for postpartum mm-hmm. is while you're still pregnant. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit tougher when you've got a newborn in your arms to do some of those things, like look up a phone number or whatever it is. And it's important that if, you know, a, a postpartum parent is coming to this podcast and, mm-hmm. you know, just realizing the need for support, then that's fine too, right? There, oh, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with, with getting it, get it. Yes. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah, yeah, right? And, and just start now. <laughs> Better than not having it. Exactly. And I think for, I mean, it's probably fair to say that a more typical birth in the United States is a birth maybe without a doula and mm-hmm. without a midwife. Mm-hmm. The idea is, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to fend for myself, go to the doctor a few times for my scan. I'm going to go to the hospital, have my baby, go home, and then six weeks later, see my doctor. What do we have to say to those moms? Maybe they don't have the, they don't have a doula or midwife available. Give me a call. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and let's also, talk about your plan. I can also <laughs> say, yeah, and in addition to that, I think... I think that I think that the overarching message to women, especially in America, I won't mm-hmm. speak for other cultures, but at large in America, the message is: um, if you're a good woman animal, then that's how you do it. You show up at the doctor, you behave well, <laughs> right? You behave. You do what they tell you to do. You show up at the hospital. You do what they tell you to do. And everything's fine, mm-hmm. right? That's it, right? That's the message. So any anxiety that's created anywhere in that program is yours and yours alone. There's nobody in that system to step up and address that you're having anxiety or that, that this system isn't working for you or it doesn't feel supportive enough or nourishing enough. And so... As is true for so much of womanhood in America. So we go through our lives sometimes, sometimes our whole lives, with a feeling that there actually does not exist a form of support that would address our needs as women at any age and stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's possible to have been born, lived through all of the arc of femininity throughout our lives, die, and not had a day where we felt like somebody knew who we were and what we were doing and how to support us. Now, having said that, it is it is a delusion. It's not what's true in the actual world, right? What's true in the actual world is there probably, even if you live in some of the most sort of bereft communities, there probably is some form of support in that community. And but for you... Just take, you know, gathering a tiny bit of courage and expressing this intention to connect with others, um, even in, you know, the most collapsed state. I mean, you know, that's when I have reached out. Mm -hmm. That's when I somehow knew I better, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Reach out. Then you begin to discover how resourced you could be and Mm -hmm. that your community actually is. And um, I don't want to necessarily say that resource for women and their families is underground, but it can feel like that, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to go around and whisper and talk and just connect and see see what happens because it does arise. That is my lifelong experience. That once I connected Mm -hmm. to, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna need a Mm handhold through this next thing Mm -hmm. or I've gone without a handhold through that thing and I I'm stuck I need somebody to go back there with me grab me by the hand and walk through it with me again till I can catch up to myself Mm -hmm. that that exists and it's out there somewhere Mm -hmm. um so yeah I think you're and really even and thank God for the internet. I hate to say it, you know, part of me is just like, shit, you have to do this via Skype. The other part of me is like, thank goodness for Skype. <laughs> right. Because yeah. if you're at home and it's snowing outside in upstate New York, you can call me and yeah. I can support you. 
You have a community, mm -hmm. right? right? Reach out to a woman. Don't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. Just move to the next place. Just move to the place where you hear, yes, mm -hmm. I see you. I love you. I'll help you. Hey, fellow parents. Can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family, and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the family album map. The family album map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. And sometimes the support that I offer to my clients is actually working through that idea that it's not okay to have support because it is so yes. culturally, as you said, not, um, not okay for women to receive. They are the caregivers. They are traditionally the ones who take care of everyone. And, um, and, and then, I mean, there's so many things I could say about it's International Women's Day that we're doing this mm -hmm. recording, you know, so there's a lot I could say. And I also work with, you know, trans parents and people who are beyond the binary and, and don't consider themselves mothers or women and yet are in the childbearing years. And so everyone needs to feel that they have a safe place to work through these issues and their challenges and to even begin to have a felt sense of what support feels like can be life-changing for someone yeah. because we are so used to doing it on our own. When I work with families, I actually also want to mention that I um, just helped found a pre- and prenatal birth and attachment clinic in uh, the East Bay, Berkeley, California, once a month. And we're offering family sessions. So it'll be two practitioners for a family to come in, either a pregnant family or a postpartum family. And we'll have two people supporting this family to make sense of their birth story, to make sense of the challenges they might be experiencing. And this is where healing happens, right? With we In this pre- and prenatal psychology work, we call it two layers of support. A little one growing in the womb has an amnion and a chorion around them, right? A two... two and the uterus and the body. <laughs> yeah, and then the, then the uterus, and then the muscles, and then the body, right? And, and ideally, the, the birthing parent has, you know, a partner, a birthing companion, compute, you know, community support, right? It's, it takes a village, right? And so letting that, those layers of support come in, that's, that's where I feel so passionate. Mm-hmm. Because then there's really time and space and an, enough support so that something different can occur. Yeah. And it might even be that we're doing ancestral healing work because that cultural conditioning, right? So in some of these small, you know, you were talking about other countries, right, other places, there might be more of a connection of community, right? Well, they're not so far away from how how it, it was done for thousands of years, maybe, right? Like, we are so far away from how traditionally we supported families to give birth and, and be with babies. And so I like to support families in in finding that, that thread, that connection to their well ancestors <laughs> um, who, who can remind us how to rest, <laughs> how to nourish ourselves, how to nourish each other. And, and th that might sound really out there for some people listening, but I have found this to be over and over again, extremely important in people's healing process Yeah, to connect with those healthy ancestors. I want to um, just bring it around to something you briefly mentioned and just say that um, while we name women primarily on this show, 
uh, I want to just say that um, it's not our intention to be cisgendered in our approach mm-hmm. here. We're talking about families and family making. And not only uh, do non-heterosexual couples have families, um, but all kinds of families can also experience loss. Mm-hmm. And so I'm imagining um, that for many families, whether they bring the actual embodied baby home with them or that embodied baby stays home with them and grows up to be a 39-year-old <laughs> and beyond, um, that, that, these, that this work reaches in your direction and can, can help you in your journey to heal and feel whole. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I work with a lot of families around pregnancy loss and and working to conceive and and then I also work with families postpartum. Sometimes it's you know as we were talking too much too fast. Sometimes it's the layers get what we call in somatic experiencing work stacked, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So maybe the birth went wonderfully and you have this beautiful being in your life and breastfeeding is going well and then there's a, a loss in the family, mm-hmm. right? So how to deal with that layer that gets piled on the, the sleep exhaustion, <laughs> right? And, and, and how to attend to that in a, in a good way, right? And something you said earlier made me feel like you were reading my mind. Mm. <laughs> but it's just so mm-hmm. typical to feel for many women that if they're not doing it the way kind of they understood things should be, and again, this might be specific to the U.S., mm-hmm. you know, with the hospital and the visits and the schedule and everything, that there's an innate weakness to that. Mm-hmm. But if they if they need help, they're weak. Mm-hmm. Or they might they might have had a friend who had a doula or something, and they think that it's just sort of a luxury or mm-hmm. some kind of like an airy theory mm-hmm. thing that people do, mm-hmm. but it's totally not necessary. But the hospital will say it's not necessary. But then again, my experience with the hospital is that no one talked to me about connection. No one talked to me about those things. And well, from a medical perspective, that may be true. That some of the things we're talking about today, what we see, are essential. Like maybe from a medical perspective, they're not essential. But then I think what the result ends up being, and I'd love your thoughts on this, mm-hmm. is that you have a woman who's had a trauma and she she deals with that internally and emotionally mm-hmm. for decades. Mm-hmm. And it goes unacknowledged her yeah. or her whole life. And that affects her, her emotional well-being. It can eventually affect her physically, mm-hmm. right? Well, at, from a medical perspective, as a licensed women's healthcare practitioner and someone specializing in neurophysiology, it absolutely is integral to focus on connection. It's vital, right? Because if we don't get that, if families don't get that, then it will, as you said, you'll feel it in your body, right? So bonding and attachment might, might not happen. So there's challenges with breastfeeding. So maybe there's the, the brain development for a baby doesn't happen in the same way because the mother is in a state of shock and can't have eye contact and eye contact builds the brain, <laughs> right? And smiling and, and those, those attachment c- connections. Right, those are actually building the neurophysiology for a little one growing. It, this is this is where the brain develops, right, from the womb till you know, eighteen months, but really even till three years. And if a little one doesn't get that, then they don't know how to go through life, and they actually don't know how to be in the world, and they're going to be challenged in so many ways. Mm-hmm. And then if a, a a mother, if a birthing parent doesn't feel that connection or that support during birth, then she's not going to feel safe to maybe get support and postpartum, you know, holistic pelvic care if she had a third degree tear or, or she has some kind of incontinence or she just doesn't feel right down there, right? But she doesn't tell anyone because she doesn't feel safe telling anyone. I've had one come to me, you know, where 10 years later, they're finally talking about it and they're finally coming to me to get support. And I don't want to have people have to wait that long. I want them to feel that they they can access their resources. And they deserve it. And they deserve it. And They're it is worthy. medically integral to their health. Right. So these subtle things that we're talking about, in some cases, quite subtle, mm-hmm. um, they could have a major knock-on effect, a ripple effect yes. for not only the mom, but the entire family, the baby, yes. years later. Yeah. I would even say, I would even um, sort of put it this way. 
no matter what, all of these things that we experience will be with us for the rest of Mm -hmm. life. The question is how, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Will you go to your grave with a feeling of lack, lacking, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of a, a, a feeling of poverty in a sense? Or will you move through these things with a sense of resource and support? And I think, you know, having experienced either, both, off and on, through various sorts of transitions in my life, some of which I've had to return to, to bring, pull me back to myself, and others that I went into with a sense of resource. I think that's the difference, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, I just worked with a, a woman who had given birth two and a half years prior and she'd had a a cesarean and had planned to have that cesarean. And, and we worked with, with her scar and we worked with the sense that she had where she had never completed the birth. Mm -hmm. And so we worked with that completion phase and there was so, I also actually really need to say that I don't specialize in trauma or ask people to review their trauma or to, you know, to tell their story because they need to repeat what happened, right? It's not about a catharsis or a a re-experiencing of the trauma. It's actually, the way that I work is that we just do a little bit at a time so that it's, so it can be integrated. And so that, that the emotion that might still be held in that cesarean scar or, you know, in the tailbone, (laughs) right? That, that those, there, there's opportunity, there's time and space for us just the healing to happen and to soften and the tissues to shift and the emotion to be expressed that maybe couldn't be expressed right then and to be witnessed in that. And then the person can move forward. And so often people will actually come to see me when they're preparing for their second baby, right? Because they want, they want to have a different experience. But in that healing and preparation for their second baby, they're also healing from that first pregnancy and having a different experience and a healing with that first baby, which is important. Yeah. So, so important. Do you find that there is a particular set of issues around connection that relate to cesarean births? Well, just by the fact that after a cesarean, most families, most mothers are separated from their baby for at least a couple of hours Yes, there's going to be a, a gap in that in that immediate postpartum bonding and attachment. You know, there is a movement of gentle cesareans, and so there there is, if one can find a great practitioner, you know, there is a possibility that you can keep the baby in arms with you after a cesarean. But any any birth procedure, anything that happens um, where a mom, a parent, and a baby need to be separated post birth. Um, can challenge that initial bonding and attachment. And it used to be very common that, you know, in the the 40s, the 50s, uh, babies would be in the nursery for days and parents wouldn't see their child. And so we've we've worked that out to some extent, but there's still experiences where babies have to go to the NICU for 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours and, and... And the bonding and attachment might not be completely, or the bonding, the connection might not be completely separated. The the parents might be able to visit, but there's still some gaps in the connection and challenges, and that needs to be healed. Mm -hmm. Or ideally. (laughs) Yeah. How is that addressed with the baby? So often when I work with parents, um, if I'm working with the baby and the parents, I'll, I'll have the, uh, I'll often do home visits or we'll get really cozy, um, in a, in a office with a <laughs> nice couch, you know, so we'll, we'll get cozy. And, um, it, if the birthing parent's comfortable, do skin to skin with the mom and the baby and, and, um, and slow things down and talk about what happened. Right. And then let the um, the birthing parents talk about how 
how it was for them and speak to the baby and listen to the baby and watch the baby. And babies will actually crawl up and show their story. They'll show, they'll show where it was hard for them, or maybe they'll just need to rest and sleep. Or um, So it's, it's actually great for parents to see how intelligent their babies are in their movement, right? That we aren't just verbal beings. We actually have intelligence and we show that through our physical movements. And so babies will show, show the parents what they need. Um, so that's one way I work with it. Sometimes if the baby isn't there and I'm just working with the, the mom, then we'll do what's called a, um, it's a two chair method or gestalt kind of voice dialogue, which is really, um, it's a, it's a type of repatterning work where um, I teach the parents how to, how to, <laughs> it's a little hard to describe, but um, how to talk with that part of themselves that they wished could have done it differently um, to have some healing or how to talk with their little one and imagine what their little one would say to them if they could have done it differently. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit of working in the imaginal realm. But what's most important about that is that the body feels the difference, right? The nervous system takes in this new way of how it could have been, right? We know what happened and we aren't trying to clear that or cancel that because that is the story. Mm-hmm. Which, what we do is we bring in another aspect of healing that allows uh, the nervous system to, to settle in a way that will support moving forward in the relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. It does. It sounds like amazing work that so many women mm-hmm. could benefit from. Mm-hmm. At, at what age, um, like, like, let's say someone has a five-year-old at home. Mm-hmm. Is it too late? No, no. I, I mean, I work with, you know, preconception through birth, through first day postpartum and six weeks and three years and five years old. It's, it's. Interesting because when they get older, it's more obvious the birth games, we call them, right? That they will, they will crawl through tunnels or they will, you know, if they come into the office, they'll, they'll be showing, especially because they, they sense the intention for a session. And if, you know, I have puppets or I have different (laughs) things for them, I'll bring my, my model doll and model pelvis and, little ones will put that model pelvis on their head oh. in different ways. And so there's, um, yeah, it's never too late to heal. And I work with adults who, who do their own birth rebirthing. So, so we, we all have that somatic memory in our tissues. I, um, I was born breech mm. vaginally, mm. but in the era of um, twilight sleep. Mm-hmm. So my mom was strapped down. Was had a mask, gas mask put over her face against her will. Mm-hmm. She said she didn't need it, and then didn't see her for two hours afterwards. Right, so that's my story. And um, uh, several years ago, I had the opportunity to do um, a Watsu mm-hmm. experience at Arvin, and I. I don't know why, but I told Mm -hmm. the woman who uh, was offering me this session uh, about that. And we sort of talked about it a little bit. And um, and she just did this thing. You know, she didn't tell me per se what she was going to do, but I really trusted her. And um, and there was this basically the the gist the healing moment for me was that she she drew me backwards up and out of the water and just onto her bosom Mm -hmm. (laughs) and held me Mm -hmm. there while I caught my breath because I had to hold my breath a long time underwater right Mm -hmm. and um and just helped me and it was just amazing and the other um a super healing moment was to see. Um, I went to uh, a panel discussion with a film about midwifery at UC, mm-hmm. and there was a, a vaginal breach delivery by midwives in the mm-hmm. home birth setting. And to see that little baby be mm-hmm. delivered by its mama and uh, go straight into mama's arms. It was just 
like I am, you talk about the imaginal, just put myself in that little baby's place, you know, and, and I mean, I've got a good imagination of just imagining the feelings of it all was just super great for me. Mm-hmm. I wish my mom could see it because my mom so could have so done it all mm-hmm. by herself, wanted to have home births, you know, mm-hmm. she, she really could have had that experience for herself. And of course, four kids later never did. And, and, um, mm-hmm. Uh, While well, she had great, I mean, great stories and powerful stories and empowering stories that I had home first because my mom, um, mm-hmm. you know, it is, it's, it is phenomenal what you can mm-hmm. kind of move into mm-hmm. uh, by engaging mm-hmm. the imagination and, and the somatic experience of that. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that, Esther, because, yes, doing work in the water is so, so beautiful for, for womb healing yeah. because we are coming from water, right, and mostly water when we're coming into the world. And, um, and then also, yes, by sharing this video that you saw and how healing that was for you, right, we can have those reparative experiences. Mm-hmm. It's possible, yeah. You're, you're sharing that and that you came out in a way that was challenging and, mm-hmm. and part of the times, right? And you were able to do it differently, right? You were able to birth your little one at home. Yeah. yeah. And I credit my mom mm-hmm. so much in that too. Mm-hmm. I mean, she, I think I've said this on our show before that every whatever we want to call it, perinatal period, right? Like the childbearing year Mm -hmm. however we get to go through that it's like a shamanic journey Mm -hmm. it's a sacred journey and all of the elements are a sacred story Mm -hmm. much like those ancestral stories that we have of gods and goddesses and warriors and travelers and you know Mm -hmm. all of those things those elements are Whatever our particular focus of our story, that's an invitation. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I had a C-section. I so didn't want to. Mm-hmm. Okay, dive deep mm-hmm. right there. It's an initiation. Yes. <laughs> or we can look at it in that way, and yeah. it can be part of the healing story, right? The medicine school that each of us signs up for in our life in various ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. One of my daughter's favorite games is to, because she's up and walking now, is to walk up behind me and then squeeze herself through my legs and just kind of look up and peek, play, play a little peekaboo. And then crawl through my legs like a little tunnel. It's so cute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you I can think really adorable. play with that with her. And that's so fun. And, and I enjoy it. And that suddenly now has a new meaning for me when you share this. Like the, the children want to reenact things and they want to re understand. And we all do, even as adults, right? We want to burrow. We, we never stop having that sensation. Yeah. <laughs> burrow and emerge. And burrow and emerge, right? <laughs> and swim and dive and, right? Cuddle, right? Mm-hmm. We, we need connection, yeah. right? We like to be squeezed, or maybe we don't like to be squeezed, and that's information too, right? Yeah. So there's always something we can be exploring. And I do what's called a, a birthing yourself womb surround group, which can be. Um, a a mini experience of a few hours or a three or four day workshop where adults get to explore their own birth journey with a a really sophisticated support team. Nice. Yeah. So cool. (laughs) Well, we're going to wrap up now. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Mm -hmm. I think final thoughts would be to have compassion for yourself and whatever you're going through and to um, reach out and I'm available for, for any questions or inquiries and would love to support you. If you want to just do a short consult with me, we can talk about how that could happen. And um, keep listening to this show. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm really enjoying being here with you all. And just the, the website for the clinic that I'm doing once a month for any local people in the Bay Area, it's prenatalbirthandattachmentclinic.com. And then my website is embodiedbeginnings.com. And um, yeah, just take time for yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on our show. That's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you, Shanti. Yeah. <laughs> and one more website for you, fourth trimesterpodcast.com. Yay. You can get our newsletter. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. 
You can find out more about Esther Gallagher on estergallagher.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone, and I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband Ben, daughter Penelope, and baby girl Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again, bicycle man I know you're doing all that you can I wrote the song, simple and true I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you You got your wheels, you got your gears you ride around town without any fear You got your pedals, you got your brakes You always wear your helmet for safety's sake Song, I sing a song for you.